Jonathan Rusha of Entort, and it's on uh, storing, manipulating, visualizing time series using open source software. So the, it's, remember guys, 25 minutes, five minutes for questions. All right, thank you very much uh, for being here. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the uh, opportunity to give this talk. Uh, I'll be uh, talking about time series, which is a, a topic of uh, great interest to me, although uh, it's something in, inside which I am uh, fairly new. I'll try to give an overview of the different packages that I found that are uh, open source, powerful, and hopefully useful for uh, some of you uh, who are also dealing with uh, time series. Uh, my name is Jonathan, and I work at Nthought. Uh, we're based in, in Texas. All right, so, so what is the problem set? I was interested in uh, looking at uh, climate data. Uh, and uh, like many other fields of research and, and science, and actually uh, life in general, uh, they deal a lot with time series. And they can, uh, if they are looking not just at weather, but at climate data, they can be looking at enormous amounts of data. So the question was, how do you deal with large amounts of data and, and hopefully uh, it's uh, it's uh, a question that can interest uh, well beyond the climate science, is how do you deal with very large amounts of data that is multidimensional and that you're trying to pass around, not hopefully not losing your colleagues when you pass around this data. And uh, you also have a lot, of, uh, a lot of the time missing values a little bit here and there because your, your weather station uh, was off that day or was, uh, was being repaired. So how do you deal with multidimensional data that uh, deals with time and that deals with uh, missing values? So, so the goal of this talk is for me to uh, three things. Uh, the first, I would like to give an overview of powerful open source packages for uh, interactive manipulations of time series. Uh, I'm going to illustrate uh, some of the packages that I'm talking about on a, on a given uh, couple questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is it going to freeze this month in Austin? I have some peach trees in my living room. I'm tired of having them. I would like to put them out, but I, am, I don't want them to freeze off. So is it okay for me to do this? This is real. Um, and the second question that I want to try to explore with, with the tools I, I, I'm going to present to you is, uh, it, what is the strongest correlation of temperatures? Uh, I come from Paris. Uh, is it more correlated with uh, temperatures in London, which is closer, or more correlated with uh, temperatures in San Francisco? And we'll try to answer this question at the end of my talk. And I'm also interested, uh, with this talk, I'm also interested in learning more about how, how you guys uh, use time series and, and uh, what, what do you do with it, what are your use cases and, and your needs and things that are missing. All right, so the first thing I wanted to do, or I had to do be, to answer my questions, were I need to retrieve data. I needed to retrieve data, so how can I do this? A couple of packages I want to I want to mention to do this. Uh, URL lib or URL lib2 uh, can help you do this and, and browse the web and, and collect uh, data files and collect them onto your uh, your uh, hard drive for for analysis lo local analysis. FTP lib also is uh, useful in Paramico for SFTP uh, to collect uh, data that are only open to uh, to FTP connections. Uh, I want to also mention that NetCDF uh, has this, uh, this great uh, open DAP support that allows you to deal with data that is remote without even bringing it on your, on your hard disk. And um, I want to, um, I want to uh, mention uh, how simple these, uh, these tools and packages are to use. You can see here that I am, uh, I am trying to uh, uh, just grab the data that I found, uh, some public data that I found on the NOAA website, and uh, I simply have to say, okay, I'm going, I'm going to import URL retrieve, and uh, I'll just uh, connect to this, uh, to this link and just download it, and it's a three-liner. All right, so now, what do I put my data in? Uh, I have several options, uh, and I will uh, mainly talk about two of them, uh, even though there are, there are more options to, uh, to, to mention. So the several options are, the first thing you want is speed when you want to deal with large data, okay? So you want something that, that, that is around NumPy. Uh, and anything else w would not be reasonable. So the first thing, is naturally, is to put in NumPy array. And I'm, that's going to be my first option. My second option would be to go and look at Psyche's the time series. And uh, the third option that was uh, uh, pretty uh, amazing, so I spent most of my time in there, uh, was to go and explore the, the uh, 
uh, West McKinney's package called Pandas. So, so let's talk about the, the options one and, and three uh, in the next few slides. Okay, so I have my data. NumPy Array, uh, we, we all know uh, that it's, uh, it's amazing. It's providing an n-dimensional uh, um, array that I can store my data in, uh, and I can expand this data, I can slice it, I can access it, and it's memory efficient. If I, if I start accessing uh, parts of this data, it's not going to make copies every time. It's going to just give me new views on this, on, on this big array. So dealing with large array, NumPy is, is awesome for this. Okay, so this is a, a, an example. If I am accessing uh, part of my array, uh, I'm not going to make copies. And the nice thing about NumPy is that it's uh, uh, pretty amazing, and so a lot of things ha has been built on top of NumPy, and, and you all know about uh, uh, the, all the SciPy packages, uh, and, uh, and even if that was not enough, there are also the Scikits projects, uh, among which stats model and time series would be, uh, uh, would be relevant to you dealing, uh, if you're dealing with uh, uh, stats with time series. All right, so the problem with my NumPy array is that if I start passing it around, then um, I don't have the labels, okay? So if I want to try to provide a description of what do, what do I have in my array, uh, uh, chances are that I'm going to take the risk to lose uh, some information and, and, and have some uh, lost in translation situations. Okay, so NumPy provides a, one option for this is if you have a, a, an array like this that actually has columns uh, that represent, for example, the, the position, this is a, a, some data about stars, for example, and you have different, you know, you have time, then you have position, and actually positions are made of different uh, subcategories, you can use what is, uh, the structured arrays and store this, and then the nice thing is that you don't have to do anymore the A of and start counting indices and, and slice, you can just access this data with, with name and it makes your code a lot more readable. So, so this is very nice. Um, uh, yet, you still didn't uh, fully label your array because you've labeled only your columns, uh, but, but not the indices. All right, so how do you do if you have very large amounts of data? You may have very large amounts of data that prevents you from um, uh, uh, storing everything in, in RAM. And that's where the memory mapping uh, uh, subpart of NumPy is, is, is really cool. So the idea of the, of the memory mapping, for those of you who don't know, is that you, you create a memmap object that is just going to look like, uh, like a NumPy array, except that it's actually going to be mapped into the hard drive if it doesn't fit in RAM. Okay, so you will be able to use it as if it was an in-memory object and you can uh, do uh, uh, all kinds of operations, all the operations that you like in NumPy, you can do them uh, w with a memory mapped object. Of course, there is a cost because you have, uh, you have access uh, to, to the hard disk to, to get your data, uh, but the cost is fairly, uh, at least in my opinion, the cost is fairly, is fairly small, 2x, 3x sometimes. Uh, it's pretty efficient. It makes your code a little bit less readable though because you have to to start say, okay, if I'm multiplying my entire array that doesn't fit in memory, I'm going to have to store it directly, uh, d directly in the hard drive. I cannot just do this operation in memory. So I'm losing the nice uh, NumPy notation and I, ha I have to start making things that are a little bit less, less readable. What OS do you, do you want to use if you're doing memory mapping? Uh, clearly the answer is Linux. Um, for, for several reasons. It's more efficient. Uh, uh, on, on many aspects. It's faster, but it's also memory, uh, memory efficient, more memory efficient. So here I'm creating an, a memory mapped array and I've not put anything in it yet. I'm gonna, I was going to store uh, data inside afterward. But you can see that here DU means disk usage. You can see that first if you have a 32-bit machine, you're going to be limited very fast no matter what OS you're using. And second, uh, if, you're, if you're doing 64-bit 64 64 -bit OS, but you, you don't put anything in your array, you see that the memory usage is actually exactly the same as the, 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 the full array that you'll need even before putting any number in it. Whereas uh, Linux will support uh, uh, sparse files and will uh, actually start using the memory as you, no as you need it and as you uh, store uh, data inside. This, is, there was, this was something new rec uh, that I discovered recently, so I, I wanted to mention that. Okay, uh, the, the second option I want to mention, and that's the, the option that I've uh, uh, played with the most uh, in, in the last uh, few months, is uh, using um, Wes McKinney's uh, package Pandas. This is a really nice package, and it provides a ton of really nice things. All the, all the things that I would want to have uh, with, with my time series. I would want to have the labeling, like I was mentioning, and I want, I want them in, in, uh, along, the, uh, along the indices as well. 
I want to be able, so this is a nightmare if, you, if, you, if you've been trying to do this by yourself, aligning data. You have data on some certain dates, uh, dates in one place and some other dates in a, another place. And how do you align data? How do you make operations between them? You, you have to figure out this can be extremely inefficient if you do it yourself. Pandas uh, offer you very easy ways to do this, uh, uh, very convenient ways and, and very readable ways. And then, once you have stored your data inside pandas, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show later that, uh, then you have all kinds of uh, statistical tools that are, that are built in and readily available. It's just a, it's just a dot away. Okay? And the, la the last nice thing is easy visualization, and I'll, I'll mention some of that uh, at, the, at the end of my talk. Okay, so uh, here is, uh, so it, it's that simple. You, you, you have your data and, and you have some missing value in the middle and you just import uh, from pandas, you import the series uh, or, or if you have a one dimensional array of data and you just stick your NumPy array inside it and then you can start uh, describing in very, very explicit and, and readable ways uh, what, what's, your, what's your dates along this data. Okay, so here I'm creating a date range. I'm going to start in, in January 1st, 2000, and I'll have a period, uh, so the number of elements is six, and my offset, uh, the, the duration between each element is going to be uh, pandas.datetools.days. All right, I can give it a name, and, uh, and I can do s very similar things with uh, the data frame, which is the 2D object in pandas. All right, if I, if I uh, uh, at any point, if I feel limited, limited by pandas, I can just uh, ask for my data frame dot values of my time series dot values, and I get back to NumPy, where I know all the, uh, all the uh, tools that, that are missing in pandas would be available there. All right, so, uh, so what do you get from this? You get something very readable, like I, was, uh, like I was saying, if you have a time series here, you'll just see the nice label at the bottom and you'll see all the indices with the dates, and you can access these, uh, these objects with, the, uh, with these nice labels. Uh, if you have a two-dimensional uh, pandas, you'll, you'll have nice labels on each column and you can access each column in a dictionary-like way. So it makes your, your code and, and mine uh, nice and readable. I really enjoy using this. And like I was mentioning, there are lots of really nice um, uh, and very convenient tools for aligning data together. Uh, I mentioned the, the aligned or the re-index uh, uh, methods. You can, you can start doing some data reduction or data reorganization with group by. Uh, and you can also deal, uh, it, it's built in to deal with uh, missing values uh, very well. So if I have a time series of a certain size and another time series of a different size with different labels and nans in the middle, I can just say A plus B and it's just going to deal with it. It's going to ignore the nans and it's going to, and you can also specify exactly the behavior you want if, if you want to do this, but it's just going to be able to, uh, to deal with all of this very nicely. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention for now about pandas is that you have very uh, convenient ways to uh, load your data from your file directly into a pandas, uh, uh, whether it's text data or whether it's HDF5 or Excel data, uh, it's, uh, it's right there at your fingerprint. All right, so um, uh, the example that I have uh, and that I wanted to mention uh, here is that, so I started to play with, uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this, date, uh, this pandas, and uh, so I, I implemented the, the few tools that I mentioned to you, and I created a little bit of code that is on GitHub, on my GitHub account, so uh, the code that is over there is really uh, not so much for, for you to use, it's not a product, it's, it's me, writing 400 lines of code to illustrate how these tools work together and, uh, and, and how you giving you uh, uh, ideas. So, so I, I created a, so I have this uh, data reader that, is, uh, uh, that, is, that knows about a few things and so, and so then I can just uh, start uh, searching for, for stations. So I, I said that I had my peach trees in my living room and again it's true so I want to know if uh, I'm going to be able to take them out. So I'm going to search for all the stations that, uh, that they are on the NOAA website uh, on the NOAA server uh, for Austin, Texas. All right, so I have a few, uh, a few um, uh, stations over there. So uh, once, I, once I know my stations, I can go and collect the data. Okay, so again, these, these uh, functions are very small. Uh, and uh, it's just to illustrate how to use these, uh, these tools. Uh, so so I'm, I'm just going to... Um, uh, oops, sorry. So I'm just going to uh, collect my data 
And let's say I'm going to collect it in the last 10 years and uh, be able to then manipulate this. Okay, so in, under the cover, it's using the the reindex. Uh, it's using the, the the pandas functions that uh, that I presented. So it's actually uh, going to take a little bit of time, but at the end, what I get is uh, is a pandas, is a three-dimensional pandas, which is a, called a panel, and then I can start slicing into it and or, uh, reorganizing things. Uh, so the group by method is what I will want to do. Sorry for this. Uh, for this part, I didn't actually mean to mean to do this. Um, uh, I'm going to be able to slice the data into um, uh, the way I want and reorganize and and group all the data by month. And I, I will do this with uh, one small function that I that I have. So so you see here what you got was a panel, and then my filter data function is just a way to access things again to uh, to illustrate. If you guys go and and look at the code, uh, illustrate and. Uh, and how to downsample your data and and uh, and reorganize it. So I filtered my data per month, and so it took January of, of each year and compounded together and calculated a min on this. And the answer is it is not going to freeze anymore uh, in Austin, so I can take out my trees. All right. I took them out last week. I cheated. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next question I wanted to do was. Um, uh, I wanted to answer was, uh, okay, uh, I have this data, I would like to store it, pass it around, uh, what do I use to store it? I have many, many options, and I explored only a, a, a few of them. You can explore them in, t in text format, CSV or, or, uh, uh, or TXT, whatever, and, and that's fine. It takes a, a fair amount of space, so you may want to use more optimized way, ways. Uh, you can do binary by yourself. You know, you can just say, uh, my NumPy array to file, and it's just going to dump the NumPy array into a file, but then watch out because you de you're dependent on, on the NumPy version of, your, of the person you're passing the file to. So you may want to explore other uh, more standard uh, ways to, to store binary data. So, so JSON is, is one of them, and the JSON library in Python is, is perfect. Uh, the HDF file format is actually uh, becoming a, a, a very strong standard in the scientific community, and, and pi tables, H5Pi, and PyHDF will be uh, your, your first uh, spots or uh, stops for, for exploring this uh, this format. I'm going to mention rapidly NetCDF4, and I don't know much about da databases, so I'll just I'm just mentioning uh, these packages, but I'll explore um, in more details the pi tables uh, uh, package. So HDF5 has some good reasons. I'm I'm running out of uh, of time, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go a little bit faster on this part, and you guys can go uh, back. Uh, I'm sorry if I go too fast. So HDF5 has lots of nice. Um, uh, features uh, uh, as, a, as a file format, so it's, it's where people, uh, many people are converging in the scientific community part, uh, and there are two very good packages to deal with them, H5Py and PyTables. I actually uh, played a little more with PyTables than H5Py, but I, I have a slide to compare them later. Um, PyTables is, is really a powerful package, and it would take an entire uh, talk to, to, to talk about it. I just want to compare this, so I, I grabbed this from the PyTables uh, web website and you can see that uh, PyTables has uh, very efficient uh, ways to compress data uh, and access your data uh, uh, faster and, and in a, in more compressed than, uh, for example, Postgre PostgreSQL. Uh, of course, uh, the fact that it's dealing with the, file, the local file system and not a server uh, client uh, system uh, m makes it faster, so uh, it's not... Uh, it's not that surprising. Then I was like, okay, uh, I heard good things about PyTables and H5Py. How can I compare them? So I, I did this. I, I created an, uh, uh, an NumPy array with, uh, with at first, uh, yeah, whatever, some values, and then compared the time that, it, that both packages need to access values or write values to, uh, to files. And it turned out that the two packages are actually uh, very close uh, in, uh, in performance, uh, except here actually the, the H5Py is, is twice as fast to uh, just go and, and load a portion of the file. But uh, the, the reason for this is that H5Py is closer to the C uh, HDF5 library, so it, it has less overhead. But they are very comparable in performances. And uh, where you gain with PyTables, and that's why I played more with it, is, is twofold. The first one is compression. So you have this, uh, this BLOSC 
a library inside PyTables that makes compression uh, relatively fast. It's not the fastest, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very good. And it's, uh, and it's very efficient in terms of, of uh, memory space. So, uh, so that's the first uh, uh, thing that I found uh, good with PyTables. Uh, the second is uh, out-of-core calculations with PyTables. So this is, uh, I think this is awesome. If you're dealing with very large amounts of data, uh, ideally you would want to be able to deal with your data, leaving them in the inside storage, not bringing them in memory because you won't be able to, and just dealing with the, with the files right away. And that's what PyTables are for you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to skip on the, on the details. So here is, is actually something that is mind-boggling. Uh, if I am uh, uh, doing this calculation, because of the components of pi tables and in particular num expression, uh, I am able to do calculations, certain calculations uh, uh, on my file out of core faster than uh, with uh, a live array. Uh, with, this is NumPy here in blue. This is the memory mapping I was talking about earlier where you can also do out of core calculations. And this is what you can do uh, with, uh, sorry, here is what you can do with compressed data um, uh, and so you see that the time is, uh, is amazing. All right, I'm going to have to skip on the, on the details and I'll finish my talk. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay, that's great. Uh, I'm going to finish my talk uh, by talking about visualization because that's how I want to answer my question about correlation between Paris and Francisco and London. Uh, so visualization. That's another nice place. That, that's another place where, in my opinion, pandas shine. Uh, you have... Oh, just, just going back for a second about, uh, sorry, it's a little bit out of order here. Uh, just to go back to my, uh, to my time series inside Pandas, you, you may want to do, before doing visualization, you may want also to have some, uh, a little bit of uh, an statistical analysis on this. And here I give a few examples of, of how simple uh, uh, it is to, to do simple things. And, and that's what you want. Complicated things, you will always have to, they will often have to be complicated, but simple things must be simple, and that's the case here. So uh, you can just do, uh, if, if S here is, a, is my time series from earlier, sorry, I called it TS earlier, I think. Uh, you can just do dot .describe, and it's, it's right of, out of the box going to tell you how many values were, uh, were non-missing values, what's the mean, the standard deviation, and the different quantiles that you may care about. Uh, also, linear regression, uh, uh, this is linear regression made simple. Uh, again, it's, it's not going to have all the, all the features that you may find in uh, scikits.stats model, for example, but this has the, uh, the basic things uh, nicely built in. Uh, so here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a linear regression be between my first time series and my second time series, and here I get all the details about this linear regression. Uh, not only the values, uh, the best fit values, but also uh, various uh, parameters to measure how good of a regression I did. And, and, and if you want to explore more correlation, which is a different uh, kind of problem, you have this dot core that we will be using in two slides, or the covariance uh, between those, those objects. All right. Uh, so going back to visualization, uh, visualization made simple. Uh, how, how much simpler can you, uh, can you do? You have a time series, you do dot plots, uh, uh, you, you, you need to have matplotlib uh, installed, but uh, uh, nowadays who, who doesn't? And, and here you get just, uh, just a, a half liner and you get a, a nice basic plot with uh, all the dates at the bottom and, uh, and your time series. Okay, see, if you have a, a two-dimensional uh, panda as a data frame, uh, there is a, a, a dot docs box plot, and I'm not going to mention all of them. There are, there are many more, and actually, I know that Wes wants to expand this, uh, uh, this potentialities. But uh, uh, here, you can, you can look at your data in a more complicated way, where you want to not only see the, the mean values that are here, the, the bars in red, but also the, the standard deviation around where, where are the 25% quantile and 75%, and what are the outliers and things like this. So you can do this, uh, again, with a half liner. I'm going to uh, mention for visualization, I'm going to finish this talk with uh, uh, talking about another uh, visualization package that is not going to be a half liner. So if you just want to look at your data, uh, matplotlib is perfect. If you want to do things that are a little bit more complicated, uh, uh, a great tool that is uh, 
that, that is out there that we, uh, that, that we uh, created and then thought, and, and Peter Wang is the original author, um, uh, is Chaco. And Chaco, uh, again, it's, it's not trying to compete with Matplotlib because, uh, because Half-Liner, you cannot compete. But it's, going to, it's actually a visualization framework. It's not really a plotting library. It's more a visualization framework on top of, so it's going to give you a plot, of course, but it's going to allow you to build the custom tools that you want. For example, if you, if you have a big time series here at the top and you want to look zoom in uh, in this part you can you can create very easily and actually I'll show you an example uh, and, and on my github page there is another example uh, very easily you can uh, just uh, create this uh, this range selection tool that is going to uh, to offer you uh, kind of a nice UI uh, on, on top of your data and this is another example of uh, of Chaco it's open source by the way of course um, all right, so uh, you need to do a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of work. Like you know, I was mentioning half liner, so this looks uh, gigantically gigantic now. Uh, but uh, uh, this is uh, the extent of what you need to do to create the simplest Chaco plot. Uh, it's not a half liner, but it, it's a ten liner, and it's worth it because then on top of this you can build an entire application that and then any scientist that is not a, a, a programmer or a software developer will be able to play with. All right, so uh, an example of this, uh, I've, I've applied this and, and spent, okay, I'm, I'm finishing here. Uh, I've spent a, a little bit of time uh, building an example of, uh, of such an application. And again, uh, I want to stress that uh, 300 lines to build an application with, uh, with uh, uh, Enum uh, and uh, a couple of Chaco plots uh, is, is pretty good. And, and just to give a, to, just to give a, a feel for, for what it looks like, um, can I move this around or do I need to give up? Uh, all right, then this is huge. Sorry. Uh, so this is an example of, of building a Chaco application. Again, 300 lines, a little bit more. Uh, yeah, and the, the screen resolution will, will kill me here. So here is, uh, uh, is what, I, uh, what I did to answer my questions about Paris, San Francisco, or London, by the way. I'm not going to have you guess because I'm out of time. But so, so this is, I just loaded my HDF5 file. So uh, the code that you could be interested in reusing in there has uh, things for uh, loading an HDF5 file, finding all the time series inside it, uh, all the pandas uh, time series inside it, and, and give it to Chaco. So, so you could just reuse this function, and, and then you get this. So what, you, what do you gain compared to Matplotlib? For example, you gain that now you can uh, either, uh, you can move around uh, the, the the, sorry, you can move around the legend or you can play with the legend, identify or just give up uh, and you can also do some correlation. So I'm just going to answer my question between Paris and London. This is a correlation between Paris and London and this is correlation between Paris and San Francisco and uh, here I'm leveraging the pandas stats capabilities to answer the question. And also if I wanted to explore if uh, the correlation dif differs uh, between uh, uh, between uh, during throughout the year, I could uh, oops, I'm, I could explore this. It's not gonna. <laughs> All right, I'm uh, I'm out of time, but you have good tools on top of this uh, to explore and answer the question. Yes, I can show the URL. <laughs> show the URL.